Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our Zebra Chat with Bailey Daniels, which we are going to get uh, underway very shortly. Uh, just as an intro, Bailey is a long-term pancreatic net patient who's had a very interesting journey, um, the details of which she's going to share with us tonight. Bailey is also a fundraiser for net research and a very strong patient advocate. We'll hear all about um, these aspects from Bailey this evening. Uh, Bailey's going to take us through her presentation first, and then we will take your questions. If questions do come to you as Bailey is speaking, uh, feel free to, uh, to write them in the chat or the question window on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, and then we will get to them at the uh, end of the presentation. Also, after the presentation this evening, you are going to receive a follow-up evaluation questionnaire by email, and we would appreciate uh, your feedback. So Bailey, thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing your story with us. Are you ready to get underway? I am. Okay. Thanks very much, Jackie. Thanks for inviting me to share my story and thank you everyone who's out there listening. So um, as Jackie said, I am a 17 year uh, net patient and uh, I am going to First, share my journey as a pancreatic net patient. That'll take up most of my presentation. And then I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, some of the fundraising I've done for CNETS Canada, as well as the volunteer position that I've been doing with uh, Cancer Care Ontario on their neuro neuroendocrine cancer um, advisory committee. So we will kick it off with my journey, which started in 2002. So I was fortunate enough to move down to the Cayman Islands in January of that year with my husband and son. And after I'd been there for a few weeks, I had this sort of funny feeling in my stomach. And I said, I thought the water here was safe to drink. It was just kind of off a little bit. But after a couple of days, the feeling went away and I didn't do anything about it. And a few weeks later, it happened again, just a slight discomfort in my stomach. I think really what was happening was I had this big tumor that was pressing on other organs and sometimes it was bothering me and sometimes it didn't. But by the third time, my husband said, go to the doctor already. So went to the doctor in the Cayman Islands, privatized uh, hospital there. So you can get in to uh, see anybody pretty much right away. And um, I had an ultrasound, which identified a large tumor. They didn't quite know where it was with the ultrasound. Um, so I had a CT there in the, in the Cayman Islands, and uh, it confirmed that I had a 10 centimeter tumor in the head of my pancreas. Uh, so I was whisked back to Toronto and I was lucky to get in with one of the surgeons at Toronto General um, pretty much right away. And while I was in his office, it was going to take a while for me to be able to get scheduled for a Whipple. But while I was in his office, uh, he happened to have a cancellation come up. Somebody called in the middle of my appointment. Um, so I managed to get the Whipple the following week. So you can, as you can see from the pictures, I went kind of from paradise to uh, the opposite of the opposite of paradise. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Whipple, I just thought I'd put in a little uh, image here that shows the gist of it. Uh, essentially, they cut off the head of my pancreas as well as took out the gallbladder, um, took out some of the small intestine and some of my stomach, and then sewed it all back up together. And my surgeon referred to it as the um, the Cadillac of general surgeries. It uh, tends to be very long and, and complicated, but thankfully he was very skilled and uh, came out fine on the other end. Um, it was three months, pretty much a full three months recovery. Um, I lost a lot of weight with the surgery, which my surgeon said, oh, people who have this surgery never regain the weight. And I said, don't worry, I'll be the exception, which I have proven to be, um, because I'm now probably 50 pounds heavier than I was uh, after the Whipple. But, um, my surgeon also led me to believe that in four out of five cases, tumors such as these are benign. Um, but in any case, uh, he prescribed that I would have CAT scans once a year for five years, and uh, I would continue to be seen by him. So after uh, my three months recovery, I went back to the Cayman Islands and uh, lived pretty much a normal life there. So uh, the following year, I... I gave birth to my daughter, I moved back to Toronto the year after that, and then I had uh, another son. And in uh, 2006, I returned to the workforce, and I was uh, working a busy job where I was doing a lot of travel. 
Um, now, because because I was a non-functioning uh, islet cell tumor, I should have mentioned this before, that means that um, I am very fortunate in that I don't have any symptoms. Um, so I don't have any flushing. I don't have uh, much diarrhea issues, although the Whipple, I guess, um, sort of loosens things up down there. But uh, I'm very, very fortunate that I live pretty much a, a normal life. Uh, and every time I've had some new scans show that I have something, it's almost like a practical joke because I feel nothing. Yeah, but I, I don't, uh, I, I know that I'm very fortunate that I don't have the symptoms to deal with. So in 2007, uh, I walked into Princess Margaret Hospital on what was supposed to be my last annual scan um, and thinking how lucky I was that I was walking into this hospital full of cancer patients and that I managed to somehow still be cancer free. Um, but I was somewhat lucky that the fifth annual CT scan revealed three tumors in the liver. And I say I'm somewhat lucky because if they hadn't been identified on the, that CAT scan, I don't know that I ever would have had another one until possibly I was, you know, much farther, much farther gone. Um, so I uh, had the three, three tumors were revealed by the CAT scan, a fourth um, appeared on an ultrasound and I was scheduled in for a liver resection at Toronto General Hospital, where 65% of my liver was removed. Um, so the, the recovery for liver resection is not uh, quite as bad as the Whipple. Uh, in the Whipple, they cut through all of your stomach muscles, and that is the real, that's what I found to be the real challenge in rebuilding those in order to be able to get up out of bed, for example. Um, but the liver resection was much, was much easier. I felt um, around 85% better after a month. It did take another couple months before I felt like I was really back to normal. And I did take a full three months off of work um, for my recovery. So after this incident, uh, I was finally referred to an oncologist at Princess Margaret. And um, this oncologist offered me adjuvant chemotherapy. So she was suggesting that I might want to do this chemotherapy cocktail to prevent any more tumors from growing. And she said this was sort of my only chance because if I didn't do it, if I waited and more tumors appeared, that um, it would be too late for the chemo to work. So I found this a very difficult proposition to deal with because you know, I was being offered this chemo that it's a sort of a once a one once in a lifetime chance to get rid of this cancer that may be somewhere within your body, but we can't see. Um, but it was also she's also offering me chemo that wasn't proven to work. So um, I agonized over this quite a bit, uh, and I ended up going to Boston to the Dana Farber um, Institute and seeing a net specialist there who. Um, told me he didn't think that it was a great idea for me to get adjuvant chemotherapy because it hadn't been proven to work. And I agreed with that. So I did uh, chose, to, chose to do nothing. And for all this time, I hadn't put, been put on sandostatin um, or have any other kind of treatment because so far in the two instances where I had tumors appear, we had cut them out. So in 2009, um, a one centimeter tumor uh, appeared in my liver and my surgeon wanted me to get another liver resection and I was really reluctant to do this because I had already spent three months recuperating from the Whipple and three months recuperating from the liver resection and I didn't feel like someone should be spending every time another spot appears that I can go get a liver resection and take three months out of my life if there is another alternative which I found there was. I did a little bit of research on radiofrequency ablation, which at the time was only 10 years old, but had some really good um, results that had been published. Uh, and radiofrequency ablation is where they stick a needle into your tumor. They're guided by ultrasound or CAT scan, um, and they heat it to an absurdly hot temperature and they burn the tumor from within. Uh, the only thing I really remember about it was that they put a really cold, you're awake for it, but they put a really, really cold pad on you to um, counteract the heat that's going on inside you. And uh, that was quite memorable for me. Um, 
So this was performed by an interventional radiologist at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. And um, I thought it was a great way to get rid of the tumor compared to a liver resection. However, I did suffer from something called post-ablation syndrome. Uh, and this is something sort of like the flu. It set in uh, six days after surgery and lasted for nine days with very high fevers. Um, well, this time went up to 105 degrees. Um, but that went away. And the only other thing that sort of was a res residual side effect from the RFA was that when I would take in a deep breath, there was a sharp pain in my side. Um, that happened for a few weeks, but it ultimately resolved itself and just went away. Unfortunately, in 2010, we found yet another uh, spot on my liver. So I was really happy I hadn't gone through with the liver resection <laughs> um, because who knows, maybe they would have suggested doing another one. But um, I decided to go through RFA again. And um, I could tell when I was lying there on the table that it wasn't going well. The spot was only four millimeters. And I think they were having a little bit of a hard time actually finding it. So they were kind of poking around a little bit. Um, and uh, I could just tell it wasn't going well. So uh, they did they did ultimately burn the tumor. But I did end up with um, a fever of 107 degrees within two days. Um, and I didn't find out for another couple days after that that I actually had two separate infections. Um, and my fever climbed even higher, even on antibiotics. So that wasn't too pleasant. I did go back to the hospital and that showed that I had an abscess on my liver. And uh, without knowing that I was going to end up in the hospital that morning, I ended up sticking around for eight days. They had to put a drain um, into the abscess and uh, that uh, was attached to a tube that went down my side and attached to this large bag that I had to uh, wear with an elastic around my leg for three weeks. It was uh, kind of uncomfortable until I figured out that I could fold the bag in half and just kind of stick it in my underwear and that made me much more mobile and much more comfortable. Um, given the choice, I would still do RFA over a liver resection again, but uh, the um, abscess and the um, post-ablation syndrome uh, definitely um, were significant to deal with at the time, but they were over relatively quickly. So to this point, every time I had a tumor appear, it was cut out or it was burned out, burned by RFA. Um, but in 2014, um, it was the first time that I had a tumor appear, which couldn't be cut out and couldn't be burned out. Um, so it was in my left iliac bone, which is in the pelvis. Uh, looking back at some of my other scans, I did have two iliac lesions that were detected in 2012, but I had bone scans after that and they described them as totally clear, so I hadn't thought it was anything. And I was also told that 30% of net patients have abnormal bone scans. Um, but I was still surprised to hear that I had a tumor in my pelvis. So I was no longer, um, I mean, I guess now I had to consider a systemic treatment um, as they couldn't uh, cut out the tumor in a, in a bone. Um, so we considered three different treatments. My doctor considered simply putting me on sandostatin, also considered sutant um, and affinitor. And I was going to go on sutant, but um, I was going on a big family trip and I figured, it's a slow growing cancer. I can wait an extra month. Um, I'm not going to start this yet because I don't know how I'm going to react to it. And I want this trip to go really well, which it did. And by the time it came back, um, I realized I really wanted to get the full picture of what was going on in my body before deciding on treatment. So at a CNETS Canada conference, uh, I think it might have been in around 2011 or so, um, one of the doctors had put up two slides side by side showing um, the same person with a CAT scan and a gallium 68 scan, uh, a net patient. And on the CAT scan, you could only see a few spots, but on the gallium 68 scan, you could see that the cancer was actually all over the person's body. And I thought, I really want to see what is going on inside me um, instead of just thinking I have this one thing in my, in my pelvis. Um, so I did some research online and I found 
a uh, clinical study that was going on in Bethesda, Maryland at the um, National Institute of Health. So I managed to get enrolled in that and I went down in August 2014 and sure enough it did show that I had um, more tumors. It showed the tumor in the right iliac bone as well as in the lymph node and three more small tumors in my liver. So that wasn't great news but I was actually happy that it hadn't spread all over the place as it had for the patient who I had seen at the CNETS Canada conference. Um, so I went back, discussed this with my doctor at Princess Margaret, and um, PRRT was, <laughs> was coming, was coming. I kept on hearing for the longest time that it is coming, and at the time it was expected to come in 2015. So he recommended going on Sandostatin um, instead of going on student and waiting for the PRRT trial to arrive. So that's what I did. In November, I had my very first sandostatin LAR injection, despite the fact I had been a patient for 12 years at that point. And within a couple of days, I broke into a rash. So it was assumed that I was allergic to sandostatin. I had these very, very itchy spots. They migrated all over my body. They tended to be symmetrical. If I had it on one arm, I had it on the other arm. And it would last there for a long time and then it would move to my legs or my back. It was just all over the place and it caused me to scratch uncontrollably. My family kept saying, don't scratch, but I couldn't help it. And I spent all of the Christmas holiday that year in the bathtub <laughs> because that was the only place that I was comfortable. Um, so I, I went to a dermatologist, he did a biopsy and it was said to be dermatitis, which basically means you have a rash. But um, I was able to set an appointment at the Adverse Drug Reaction Clinic at Sunnybrook Hospital. Um, but I was going to have to wait till March 2015. And I was really going out of my mind with this rash, but I had to wait to get my appointment there. So I happened to be going to Washington, D.C. in February. And because I had been to NIH on the Gallium 68 study, um, I was able to get in to see an allergist there and she gave me the opinion that the rash was an allergic reaction and that I should never ever uh, go near Sandostatin LAR again. Um, but you know, octreotide, which is um, what Sandostatin is made of, is used in a lot of net treatments and this didn't seem like the ideal situation. Um, so when I went to the Sunnybrook Adverse Drug Reaction Clinic finally, um, they sensitized me to Sandostatin in very small doses. Um, so I, bit by bit, I had to learn to inject myself with the short-acting sandostatin, and I'm kind of squeamish. I never thought I'd be able to inject myself, but you do what you have to do. And I did it for around six months when they decided, okay, it's time that you can try a partial dose of sandostatin LAR, and I reacted fine. So I started full doses of sandostatin LAR. Um, in January 2016. So to this day, I still don't know if the rash was a coincidence or if I really am allergic or was allergic. I do still have the rash um, at times. It kind of comes and goes. So who knows, but uh, I am on sandostatin and that uh, kept me going for quite some time. Um, at the same time, while I was going through all of this uh, desensitization. Uh, I had an MRI which indicated that the tumor on the, my left uh, iliac bone had grown to a size that concerned my doctor, 3.2 centimeters. So he recommended that I get external beam radiation, um, which is what it sounds like. It's, you know, a laser beam basically that's, that's shooting at one very specific spot on your body. Um, I actually did complain to the doctor just recently, like why did they actually tattoo your body to ensure the I have three three spots to, on each hip and kind of under my belly button because they want to make sure that you are in the exact same location every time you have the radiation. Um, and I said to him, you know, this is a permanent thing on my body. Couldn't they have used a sharpie? I could have promised not to shower for the five days. So he actually said recently that uh, they're doing a study on it. So. Glad that uh, my comments at least had some impact there. Um, now, I'm, I note here that I'm unsure of the effectiveness because they kept saying, well, we can still see it, but it may be, it may be necrotic tissue, it may be dead. So I really don't know if the external beam radiation 
worked wonders or, or did nothing. I still don't know. Um, in any case, um, I did get to go to do the gallium 68 scan in Bethesda um, for four years in total, and it did show that uh, my tumors were stable. Um, I didn't say much about gallium 68. I have no idea who's out here, who's out there in the audience listening to this, but if you're fairly new to uh, neuroendocrine cancer, gallium 68 is kind of, I think, considered the gold standard in um, scanning this type of cancer today. And I'll talk a little bit more about your access um, to that later. So everything was fine. Um, for the last few years. In 2017, I decided to retire. Uh, my job was very stressful and uh, I was working all the time and I thought, I don't know where this cancer is going to lead me. I'd rather be spending the time with my family. And fortunately, um, I was able in a financial position that where I was able to retire. And I also wanted to spend more time going to the gym and getting fit so that I would be in a position to fight off whatever happened to come my way. So that takes us to this year. In January, a CAT scan revealed that uh, one of my liver tumors had grown and I had a new t tumor appear in a lymph node. And my doctor jumped right on this, took it to the tumor board. Like my scans were on a Monday. I think the tumor board was on a Tuesday. And he took it to the tumor board right away before I had even had a chance to discuss it with him, which was great. I was glad he was so proactive about it. Um, and I was approved to go on the Ontario PRRT trial, which I believe actually launched in, in 2016. Um, I hadn't gone on it, even though I had been waiting for it to come, by the time it actually arrived, my cancer was considered stable, so I wasn't a candidate. But now that it had grown, um, I did become um, approved for the trial. And so the first thing that they do when you um, sign on to the trial is that you have a gallium 68 scan which until recently this was the only way you could get a gallium 68 scan in ontario um, was as part of this trial so unsurprisingly the gallium 68 scan showed that i had more tumors than you could see on the cat scan um, so i ended up with um, a total of of 10 10 tumors um, whereas i think we we thought i had five or I guess by the time with the CT seven, um, so they were they were in a couple of new 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 parts like my shoulder and the top of my leg, which um, I had no idea about. So I had my first round of PRRT in March. Um, I had heard I'd watched some videos online and and heard from some patients at the C CNETS Canada support group that um, each each round of PRRT. Their side effects were different or non-existent, and it really depended by round. Um, so far, I've had two rounds, and that has also been my experience. The first time, um, I found that I had a little bit of fatigue afterwards. Just, I think it didn't hit me until the next day, and just for a couple of days, I was on the tired side. I think I took a couple naps in the afternoon, and I had this low-level nausea, which I kind of wish was worse so that I would actually throw up and get rid of that feeling of being nauseous. But um, I had assured them at the hospital that I had my own nausea medication at home, which worked for me as a person who gets seasick, but it wasn't strong enough and I endured this nausea. It also kind of affected my food preferences. I typically have a salad for lunch and I wanted nothing to do with lettuce. It just did not uh, appeal to me somehow, sort of like when a person is uh, pregnant, sometimes the food, food preferences change. And that lasted almost a month, probably. Um, I also had experienced some hair loss. I think it, I, I'm someone whose hair sheds regularly anyways. I did notice it got a little bit worse, but by three weeks after the PRRT, I, it was actually coming out in, in clumpfuls in, in the shower and I thought I was gonna be bald. So it was a very scary moment. Fortunately, um, I'm not bald. Uh, but my hair definitely has thinned. And with the second round of PRRT, I found the same thing happened around the third week afterwards, um, although not as extreme the second time. And my third round of PRRT is tomorrow. Um, for those of you who are interested in what the PRRT experience is actually like, um, you go in uh, early in the morning, um, 7.30 at the hospital, and they start giving you both amino acids and anti-nausea drugs by IV. 
um, and they let that uh, run for quite a while before they actually administer the PRRT, which lasts around a half an hour. Um, and then they continue to let the amino acids go for, a t it's a total of around four to five hours, and that is uh, being given to protect your kidneys. Um, after that, when that is all done, you head over, uh, in, the, in my case at Princess Margaret, you head over to um, Toronto General to get a nuclear scan, um, and you have to go back to do that again on Wednesday morning and also on the Friday morning. The PRT is always on a Tuesday morning. So what they're doing is the, the Ontario study is looking at individualized dosimetry, meaning um, they're altering the lever, level of radiation that you're getting in each cycle, uh, depending on how well your kidneys are handling the, um, the radiation. So um, that's, that's why you're going for the scans three times after. Um, now, I was patient number 49 on the Ontario PRRT trial, and the first 50 patients only, for some reason, are getting a second gallium 68 scan just before round two. And so I wanted to share that I actually have exceptionally, I was showing exceptionally good results so much so I had to email the doctor and say, is this, is this real? Should I be reading something else into this? Um, so I've quoted from it here. It said I had a, this was the summary, very good response to treatment with resolution of the lesion in the liver and the left internal iliac lymph nodes and significant interval decrease in radio tracer uptake in the retroperitoneal lymph node and bone lesions. So fingers crossed, seems to be working. Um, this is possibly, of the most positive results um, the two doctors I've spoken to about this have seen. Um, so it's looking good and I won't actually know until I believe it's three months after uh, this, the last round, which is going to take place in September, um, what, you know, what the final results on that are. But um, so far it seems to be doing really wonderful things. So I just wanted to uh, sum up sort of this section of my presentation in a more general way about living with neuroendocrine cancer because I've been living with it for so long. Um, and for those of you who may be new to it, I, I want to give you some, some hope and, and make you realize that, you know, just because you have cancer doesn't mean you're going to die tomorrow and it doesn't mean that you can't live a really positive full life. And my attitude is I don't let it stop me from living my life. I do pretty much everything that I used to do. Um, I travel the world extensively. And uh, I really do look at the silver lining. I guess I'm a, a cup half full kind of person, but I do feel lucky to have a slow growing cancer instead of um, a disease which could be much worse. Uh, I have a couple of cousins who had Whipples because they had pancreatic cancer and they are no longer with us. So, you know, to have sort of the gift of a slow growing cancer, um, there's, there's also a lot of other diseases that are a lot worse. So this is something that is manageable that you can live with. And, uh, you know, it does give you a different perspective though. Um, you know, you, you have to appreciate what you have, value and celebrate life every day. Um, I've also realized through the years and having many different encounters with so many different uh, doctors and, and medical staff that, um, really, they're, they're making educated guesses. You know, they've been trained and they are specialists in particular areas, but uh, they don't necessarily always have the answers. And especially in uh, NETS, there is no prescribed uh, sequence of treatments. So you kind of have to research and find out what's out there and be your own advocate um, because not every doctor is going to agree on what the best course of action is necessarily and you have to sort of be an active participant in figuring out what care is best for you. Um, so in closing on this section I would say stay positive. I'm, I've am i been with this for 17 years now and I am still growing going strong and you know continue to live a very uh, very happy life with this disease. So I'm going to move on now to uh, talk a little bit about the fundraising that I have done. So before I started fundraising, I really would not have considered myself somebody who was inclined to fundraise. The idea of asking somebody personally for money and uh, have the possibility of being turned down was 
this is kind of too much for me to think of bearing. Um, but in 2008, I heard an ad on the radio for the Ride to Conquer Cancer, which was raising money for Princess Margaret Hospital, um, now Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation or Cancer Cancer Center. Um, so the foundation takes the money and, and uses it for research and other valuable things at the hospital. And since I was a patient there, I thought, well, I can ride a bike. I've never ridden a bike over 200 kilometers before, but I could train and I could do this. And with the invention of email and being able to ask people for money over email, this made things much, much easier because if somebody doesn't want to give to your campaign, they just don't have to reply and that's fine. It's not awkward. You'll see them again and move on and that's totally fine. So I did the Ride to Conquer Cancer um, eight times between 2008 and 2017. It was a fantastic event, but I also um, you know, was very aware of CNETS Canada and had attended a number of different CNETS events and, and thought it would be great to raise some money for CNETS as well. So in 2010, I decided to do an event um, specifically for CNETS, which I organized myself. I called it Bailey's Kayakathon for Cancer Research. And um, I got a few friends and we basically went on a, on a three-day kayaking trip in Georgian Bay. And I asked people to sponsor me and we managed to raise over $11,000. So I was pretty happy with that. The next year I decided to go back to the ride because I loved that as well. Um, but um, I did ask, I, I sort of split my fundraising. I asked some people to support me for the ride, which has a minimum, um, minimum um, amount that you have to raise of $2,500 which definitely sounds like a lot of money and was very, it is a lot of money. And it was, you know, so it took, took me aback at first, but once you start, once you get going, um, you know, there's definitely a way to get there. So I, I asked enough people to get me to the $2,500 minimum for Princess Margaret. And uh, I asked everyone else to please make a donation to CNETS Canada, which raised just over $6,000 that year. So in 2018, um, my husband, who was also doing the Ride to Conquer Cancer, and I decided that we would really like to focus our fundraising efforts on CNETS Canada. As great as the Ride to Conquer Cancer is, um, you know, it's a, it's a fun event, it's a social event, it's a challenge. Um, but, you know, we really thought the money that we're raising for Princess Margaret is just a drop in the bucket. The ride tends to raise almost $20 million a year. And with the approximately $20,000 that we were raising together for Princess Margaret, that could be put to, you know, could have more impact with CNETS Canada. So we decided to establish our own triathlon. It was a little bit of an unorthodox triathlon because I don't really swim and I definitely don't run. So we did a kayak, bike, hike triathlon, which are three of my favorite activities. And we did it a couple hours north of Toronto. And um, we set our goal originally at $20,000, hoping that we would each be able to raise uh, 10. And we managed to raise a total of $27,400 by 147 separate donors. So we were very, very pleased with that. It, it exceeded our expectations. And then we got a very big surprise when CNETS Canada was able to top, top it up um, to, to, to the $40,000 that is necessary in order to fund a research grant. So this was an incredible opportunity um, because in the past, I think CNETS was usually doing two research grants and we really had wanted to make an impact in neuroendocrine cancer. And with the fundraising that we did, we were able to sponsor a third uh, grant, which CNETS Canada wanted to name it after us, which was um, a little, not only a little embarrassing, but also I, I really felt like it is our supporters, it is our donors who really deserve the credit, um, who have been giving year after year after year. So um, we called it the Daniels Constellation Grant for neuroendocrine cancer research because I really feel like our supporters are our stars um, in, our, in our constellation. So this allowed me to sit on the grants committee for CNETS Canada. Uh, last year I had input into which projects got funded 
And um, the one that uh, I chose to be the recipient of our specific grant was called Extending Immunothera Immunotherapy to Net Patients with Radiotherapy, um, which was uh, being led out of Sunnybrook. And um, I thought that this was a really an outside the box kind of thing. Um, immunotherapy to date has not really worked with neuroendocrine cancer because um, apparently uh, we have a low rate of genetic mutations and that makes it difficult for the body to uh, mount an effective immune response. And so the idea is let's um, radiate the tumors first, which will make them inflamed, and then perhaps um, they will be able to have the response that is required um, to be treated by immunotherapy. So we'll see if it works, definitely worth, worth a try. And uh, I look forward to seeing the results of that. So uh, we decided that we're going to do another triathlon this year. It's taking place on August 10th. Uh, we did up our goal to $40,000. We're hoping to be able to fund an entire new research grant ourselves. Um, so far, we're um, at just about $25,000. And if you want to see anything more about that, you can take a look on the CNETS Canada website. They have a link to it in their in their fundraising area. So um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about today was uh, volunteering. And when I decided to retire, I had a little bit more time on my hands. No, I really had a lot more time on my hands. So this, I, it was kind of uh, excellent timing that uh, Cancer Care Ontario, or CCO, last year put out um, a call for actually I'm, I'm jumping I'm jumping ahead see let me start by saying CCO had a neuroendocrine tumors program in 2010 um, but it was strictly about um, how do we give net patients in Ontario access to PRRT and that's what the whole committee was about um, and they eventually launched the clinical trial in 2016 so in 2018 they decided to create a new neuroendocrine tumors advisory committee which would be more broad. It's looking at what do neuroendocrine tumor um, patients in Ontario need overall, not just PRRT, but what else do they need in terms of diagnosis and treatment. Um, and so um, in June, they put out a call for participation for what they call patient family advisors to join the committee. Um, and uh, I was, I, I put in an application and had an interview, like I was applying for a job, and I was happy to be invited to join the committee, which is made up of five um, staff from CCO, 21 doctors, and with a variety of specializations. Um, I mean, they're all neuroendocrine focused, but some are surgeons, some are oncologists. Um, there's a variety of types of doctors on there. Um, and uh, three patient family advisors, of which I am one. So uh, I'm currently slated to do this until March 2020. Um, it could be renewed beyond that. We'll, we'll see what happens. And the main thing that's happened while I've been part of that committee is that uh, Gallium 68 scan has been um, approved for use in Ontario outside of the PRRT trial, which is fantastic news because not everybody qualifies for the trial or needs that kind of treatment, but many patients can use the Gallium 68 scan to see what is really happening inside. Um, so it, unfortunately, it does have some qualifiers on there. You need to be this, you need to be that. Um, but there is one catch-all, which is, um, or backstop, perhaps I should say, which is that if your doctor feels that you need it, then they can make a case for it and you will gain access to it as well. Um, so I've found it a little bit frustrating that the process with CCO is very slow. The meetings are only every other month. Um, but I have also found it gratifying to be able to be one of the patient voices and uh, represent us in terms of what neuroendocrine cancer patients uh, currently, currently need. So that is uh, what I had planned on saying today. Thank you so much for listening, and I would be very happy to take any of your questions. Bailey, before we move on to questions, I just want to, on behalf of uh, the entire community, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It is so inspirational. Uh, you do this, uh, you're so positive, uh, and it's, um, 
you know, it's just inspirational to hear that this journey has been so long, uh, but you're still so positive uh, about every aspect of it. So uh, thank you for sharing that with us. And also thank you for everything that you have done for this community uh, through your fundraising and through your advocacy work. Uh, it's really much, uh, very much appreciated. We, we, uh, we really appreciate everything that you've done. So thank you. Well, my pleasure. And I have to say there was no CNETS Canada when I started this journey. And I didn't find out about it right away when it uh, when it launched, but I also have uh, really learned a lot from attending some of the patient education events and from talking to other people in the community. So thank you too, Jackie, and thanks to everybody who gets involved. Right, right. Well, it's all about paying it forward, right? <laughs> Indeed. Okay, so we have a few questions. Um, the first question relates to PRRT. Um, someone wants to know if you can have breakfast before you have PRRT. Yes, there's actually um, no restrictions on eating and they actually they actually bring you both, at least in Ontario at this particular trial, they bring you both breakfast and lunch um, while you're in the bed there. So there is no restriction on eating whatsoever. Okay, great. Now you talked about um, uh, the RFA and the abscesses that you had developed. Were the, was the abscess that you developed in the same location that the tumor was in? I actually do not know the answer to that question. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. All I knew was that I was, you know, <laughs> I was delirious with fever. Um, so I'm not sure if it developed in the exact same spot, unfortunately. Okay. I'm yeah. just wondering how it was that um, that what makes one susceptible to this um, this condition that happens afterwards, and and why did you get it twice? Yeah, I don't I I don't know. I hadn't done very much reading on that. I had I had heard about it a little bit, um, mm -hmm. and definitely I had very different experiences on the table <laughs> the first time and the second time. In in that the first time seemed to go perfectly fine. Like I don't think. You know, it was a centimeter, it was easily seen, they ablated it and, and I left. Um, whereas the second time I, I knew they were poking around in there and that couldn't be good. Yet, you know, the result the second time was worse, but I still did get the post ablation syndrome the first time. And I I cannot say why I, I had heard of it um, before I went in there also, but I don't know why it happens. Right, okay. So with respect to qualifying for the PRRT trial, as I'm sure you know, there's some um, criteria for people to qualify. And the KI-67 is something that's uh, often talked about uh, to patients, which is the proliferation of their tumors and the, the percentage. Can you tell us what your KI-67 was on, and on various tumors, if you know? Yeah. So um, both my original pancreatic, um, the tumor in the pancreas, as well as the one from the liver, I think both had a KI-67 of 15%, uh, and I've never had any other tumor biopsied or, or kept. They were also small and they were burned away, so um, I don't have any other measurements, but 15. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, next question is, I'm not sure this is one that you'll be able to answer, but I, I certainly can. Sure. Uh, is the PRRT trial only in Ontario? We are in Alberta. Do you have that knowledge? Are you able to? I'll let, I'll let you take that one, Jackie. Okay. <laughs> so PRRT is not only in Ontario. It's actually available in Ontario uh, and Quebec and uh, Alberta. So there is also a trial at the Cross Cancer Institute uh, in Alberta. So if you want more information about uh, that trial and how to access it, you're more than welcome to contact Enrico Mandarino who is our executive manager and uh, patient support coordinator at CNETS Canada, and his coordinates are on our website. Uh, the next question, is the gallium-68 scan also only in Ontario, and is there much of a difference in the gallium-68 and a PET scan? So my medical knowledge is not deep, I'll tell you that. But what I, what I can tell you is that... Um, and I'm sure Jackie will Jackie will say more on this, but I know that Ontario patients were going to Quebec before we could get it in on in Ontario. It's only been a few months. Um, Ontario patients were actually approved to go to Quebec to get the gallium 68 scan. I know not it was on a case by case basis. I have heard of patients who were not approved to go. 
Um, so then I, I know that it's in Quebec. Um, Jackie, do you want to speak to where else you can get the scan? Actually, it's only in Ontario and Quebec. Um, there is a trial, that's not true, sorry, there is a trial also in Vancouver. Um, it's comparing the FDG, I believe, and the Gallium 68. So those are the only three locations. But I think the Vancouver trial um, has had some recruiting issues. I think it's been slow to recruit. So I'm not sure that it's fully underway. Um, but mm -hmm. at this point, Ontario and Quebec are the only two locations where it's um, more readily accessed. Okay. And with respect to the question on the difference in the Gallium 68 and the PET scan, um, a Gallium 68 is a PET scan. So I'm not uh, totally clear on the question. I think it's actually, is it not a PET CT? I think it's a combination. Yes, you're right. Yes. So, so if, if, the, if we weren't able to answer your question on that, whoever submitted it, please feel free to resubmit. Uh, with I, a I, actually could, I actually could say uh, just another word on, on that. So just from having okay. read the report um, or the reports, so the gallium 68, it actually measures like the uptake value of, again, I'm not very medically um, articulate, so pardon me for this, but it's measuring the uptake of the dotatate in your tumors. So it's actually like a volume measurement, whereas the CT scan is measuring the size of the tumor. So I think that, and you know, so getting both of those together is great. Um, so if you only have the PET scan, I believe you only have sort of the measurement of how much your tumors had an uptake of the um, nuclear element. Okay, thank you for that. So there was an initial question um, about symptoms before your presentation began, and so you've clarified that you were have been symptom free, uh, but yes. that individual also to thank you for sharing your story and for being an inspiration. So I just wanted to mention that. Great. Uh, got another. So uh, thank you, Bailey, for your talk and all of your wonderful advocacy. In terms of your access to PRRT, was your KI67 number a factor? I think that it was. I think they do have a limit. Um, I'm really bad at remembering numbers. I think that it's, a, Jackie, I'm not sure if you know, I think the limit is 20 or 20, yes. mid-20s. I believe so it's 20%, as far right. as I'm aware, yeah. So it wasn't an, it wasn't an issue for me. Okay, uh, next question. I just want to thank you for your fundraising efforts. A family member of mine had immunotherapy after PRRT and was lucky enough to have exceptional private coverage. He was at the end of life when he tried the immunotherapy and his quality and quantity of life was extended by over a year. So that's not a question, but just a, a comment from someone. Good. Well, good to know. Good mm -hmm. to know. So um, this question, now that CCO has arranged for gallium-68 scans outside of PRRT, do either of you know how long it is taking to get one once you are referred? Well, I was pretty fast. I, I was, you know, I went to the tumor board the beginning of January and I was slotted in for mid-March. So that was in the medical world relatively fast, I think. So I think this question is about uh, now the, to access the gallium 68 scan. How long oh, does to it access take? the gallium 68? Yeah, but outside of know. the PRT. Once you're referred, mm -hmm. I have heard. I will say I have heard from within the community that uh, there is seems to be a delay. Not sure if there's a backlog um, or what's happening, but uh, there does seem to be, be a delay in access, uh, which you know I, I don't really have any more information than that on it. I don't yeah. even. I, I do know. I remember. I remember Dr. Rebecca Wong, who is the overseer of the Ontario PRT trial, when she came to speak in Toronto at Wellspring on a patient education day. I remember this is a few years ago. I remember hearing her say, "And we have excess capacity on the gallium 68, and we're selling it to other parts of the hospital." It was very frustrating for those of us who really wanted the gallium 68. Mm -hmm. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure what happened to all of that excess capacity but you would mm. think that there shouldn't be a backlog. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. That's just, you know, what I've heard from the community, but I have not heard anything directly from, uh, you know, the hospital mm -hmm. or CCO on that. So I don't have any, any other details. 
Um, so so I'm, glad somebody brought, I'm glad you brought that up because I can ask about it at the next uh, CCO meeting also. Good. Uh, if any other questions, please feel free to submit them. Uh, we just have another. Uh, okay, here we are. I've got another one's just come through. Thank you so very much for your story. I also had peanut removed in 2007 and have recently come back from the NIH and they found a liver spot. Your story is so inspirational to me. Great. Well, there's no question. It's definitely not the end of the world. You're going to take care of it and move forward. And good luck. Yeah. I think that's the really important message and why your story is so inspirational is because it's so long term and you have had faced so many hurdles over the years, but you've got through every one and you just keep on going, which is It's amazing when, you know, when I was putting together this presentation, it was amazing to me how it seems like I've been through so much because I've had like not every treatment that's out there, but so many of them. But you know, over a 17 year period, it doesn't feel like it has taken over my life. It's not the main focus of my life. Mm -hmm. I, I, I make sure that it's not the main focus of my life. Right. Great. Okay. Well, I don't have any more questions here. So I'll just give another second or so to see if anything else comes in, but it doesn't look like it. So Bailey, I want to thank you again on behalf of the community and on behalf of CNETS Canada for taking time this evening to share your story with us. It's been great. Uh, this will be available on our website after the uh, after we conclude. So Rico will probably have it up, I imagine, by tomorrow uh, or shortly afterwards. So for anyone who uh, hasn't been able to join us this evening or if you know of anybody in your community uh, who wants to, uh, to watch it, it will be on our site. So once again, Bailey, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And we wish you nothing but the absolute best with your PRRT treatment. And we hope that the positive results continue for you. And thank you. We'll updates in the future. Great. Thanks, Jackie. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.